All right, this video is on lipids or fats and oils. And so you might remember for our, from our organic unit that long carbon chains that have hydrogens around them are going to be considered nonpolar. And fats and oils are generally nonpolar. Therefore, they are not soluble in water, but they are soluble in other nonpolar solvents. Um, the reason, even though you see H's and O's together, the reason that fats are generally considered nonpolar is because compared to the length of the chain, those OH groups are very small. Um, in terms of foods, you do need a diet that has fats in them. Um, about 10 to 20 percent of your intake should be, 10 percent to 20 percent of your diet should contain fats. And the reason, they do actually provide some function for your body. They provide insulation, um, they cover some of the parts of the body like your kidneys, that helps protect those. Um, and they're a good component. They're a component in your cell structure and in your metabolism. Now, the structures of fats and oils. If you look at the esters of 1,2,3-propentriol, which is glycerol, and a long, car long carboxylic acid chain, and I'm going to show you these structures here in a second, but there's a glycerol mo molecule, so you can see why it would be called 1,2,3-propane-triol. And then if you take these, the three fatty acids, so if you look at this, structure to the right here. This is the 1, 2, 3 propane triol, but in a condensation reaction with a carboxylic acid, these black molecules here, water would be cleaved off 1, 2, and 3 times, and what you have made is called a triglyceride. Alright, for carbohydrates, um, they're obtained from different foods like cereals, fruits, vegetables. They all have the empirical formula of C, M, and then H2O to the N. So the simplest one is C6H12O6, glucose. Plants make a lot of these, glucose being an example. And they're generally referred to as sugars. Um, the sugars are the lower molar mass carbs, and generally they're crystalline solids and dissolve in water. So if you think of glucose sucrose, which is table sugar. All of those examples are, are solids at room temp. Monosaccharides are the simplest carbohydrates and they have that empirical formula of CH2O. They're either aldehydes or ketones and they have one carbonyl group and at least two hydroxyl groups. Now some examples would be the simple sugars we discussed, glucose, fructose, ribose. They are soluble in water because the molecule size is small and they have at least two hydroxyl groups. So in relation to the molecule size, those OH groups matter and make them water soluble. Um, when you take monosaccharides and you put two of them together, you form a disaccharide. If you put three of them together, you'd get a trisaccharide and then continuing on until you have many and that's a polysaccharide. Now, a disaccharide would be formed in a condensation reaction from two monosaccharides. Okay, we already know what a condensation reaction is from organic. It's when you take two functional groups, put them together, and a small molecule leaves, in this case, water. The disaccharides, and this is usually asked in IB exams, is at least to name two of them, and you'll have some of these structures in your data booklet, but two, two um, or excuse me, three examples, maltose, lactose, and sucrose. Now polysaccharides are many of them together. Um, they are the, the things that you think of as storing energy in your body. Starch being one of the biggest ones. Um, and that is where glucose is stored in plants. And glycogen is an example of animal cells. And cellulose, which gives bulk to food, um, is also an example of a polysaccharide. So starch, glyco starch, glycogen, and cellulose are examples of polysaccharides. Sorry. And cellulose is one we cannot digest. So moving on to proteins. Now proteins are polymers made from combinations of 20 different two amino acids. Now again, you bio kids probably have already really heard this a bunch of different times. But um, when we talk about an amide, so a C double bond O, connected to an NH or an NHR group. That is an example of a peptide bond. And 
an amino acid then has a carboxylic acid group on one side and an amino group on the other and a dipeptide would be formed from two amino acids, tripeptide from three, etc. Now the primary structure of the, the protein is um, the sequence of amino acids. So they usually have like three letter combinations that they use like ALA for al alanine, um, et cetera, cytosine. And so those three letter codes give us an example of the structure, the primary structure. Then the secondary st structure describes the way that the chains would fold or twist to align themselves. Now, fats, moving back to fats and oils, most naturally occurring fats contain a mixture of all sorts of things, saturated, fats, where all of the bonds are single bonds, monounsaturated means we have one double bond, polyunsaturated means you have more than one double bond, and their chain lengths can vary. So if you have a fat that you are eating where it's a mixture, it's going to be classified as the one that's most largely present, the predominant type. So a saturated fatty acid would be something that has only single bonds in the carbons, and they're generally from animals. Um, the tetrahedral arrangement, so picture this molecule, tetrahedral arrangement, allows for close packing of molecule chains. So if you could think of stacking those chains kind of one on top of another, when they can close pack like that, their, their intermolecular forces are extremely strong because they have large molar masses, they're tightly close packed so they are close to each other and they're attracting each other and therefore their boiling points are relatively high so therefore they're going to be solids at room temperature. When you start adding in a double bond we become they become an unsaturated fatty acid or an unsaturated fat. So remember fatty acid really means the same thing as fat. Um, these double bonds provide a kink in the chain and that makes the molecule not be able to line up closely especially when they're kind of randomly arranged throughout and so therefore they can't get as close together they can't pack in as tight and they have lower boiling points therefore they're usually liquids at room temperature think of like vegetable oil um, as an example that's a liquid at room temperature whereas butter is a solid at room temperature and uh, that's a saturated fat the more double bonds that you have along your chain, the lower the melting point's gonna be. Now, if you have a highly unsaturated fat, more double bonds, the less solid it will be. And monounsaturated fats are things like olive and canola oil. Um, polyunsaturated fats are like sunflower, corn oil, fish oil, etc. The saturated fats are things that are fat at solid at room temperature. Examples we mentioned earlier, bar butter, lard, coconut oil, shortening, all solids at room temperature. Now, cis and trans forms of unsaturated fats. You guys should know from the organic chapter what cis and trans mean. And cis fats are generally better for you because when you have two groups that are going in the same direction, they can't stack easily because you have two pointing up and they can't get close to each other. But when you have a trans isomer, the trans isomer is like a, uh, you have one down, then a double bond, then one up. And what will happen is they can pack in nice and tight. So trans fats occur like, they, they, they're almost like they're like an, a saturated fat. A trans fat ha behaves like a saturated fat in a sense, but luckily the cis isomer is the most common, so we just have to be careful with trans fats. Um, they are going to lead to the same problems as saturated fats will, so giving you the low density um, cholesterol, the LDL, so the stuff that does not, that will clog your arteries, it doesn't sink into the arteries. Um, cis and trans forms, again, if you look at the transform uh, isomer, they're harder to metabolize because, again, they are like a saturated fat. They're not as good as an energy source. They're not going to be as efficient when they're burned in terms of a combustion reaction or even in your body when you're trying to burn those fats. The melting point of a fat is the key factor in what's used in food. So 
if you ever notice when you're cooking, a lot of times it does ask for lard or it does ask for butter because it's going to give you a different um, texture than say using olive oil or vegetable oil. So fats that are used in things like cocoa or confectionery candy, they melt at body temperatures. But baking, when we want to bake cakes and things like that, they have to melt at a higher temperature. Um, when you mix fats, they do not melt at a fixed temperature either because they're a mixture of fats and they're going to have a range of melting points. We're going to stop here for this video and we'll break it up into a second video. So I'll give you guys a break here just for a second.